I'll take this question. After uh, uh, the comments made by our students here, so would you please all come up uh, here? Uh, I'll just Studies, but also from anyone from Indonesia culture studies. No, but we are all from. Uh, but actually, it's uh, so very much closely uh, linked uh, to programs. Uh, yeah, uh, we are. They, they have taken the uh, classes of the same uh, teachers and uh, uh, discuss with uh, the same uh, classmates. And uh, we'll go in the order of. Um, uh, we'll start from uh, uh, Tang Huiyu, uh, our uh, very senior uh, doctoral candidate, uh, who is uh, graduating this semester. Okay. So, Huiyu, uh, and then uh, Tuna Shama. Uh, Huiyu uh, actually is our seventh year student, right? Seventh. Okay. Uh, Tuna, our third year uh, doctoral student, right? Huh? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Tunan Sharma uh, from India. Okay. The third will be O Yi Jun O. Yi Jun O. Also our third year doctoral student, right? Yi Jun. Yeah. And then Pisa Vasudeva uh, from India, our first year doctoral student. Okay. And the fifth will be uh, Shi Jun Ling Ling Shi Jun. Uh, our first year that was okay. So I look forward to their challenges and uh, debates, uh, but maybe not, okay. Uh, maybe uh, a modification <laughs> of, uh, uh, or implementation, whatever, okay, of uh, Dr. Uh, of Professor uh, Mignolo's talk that uh, they have been inspired over the past maybe several years. Okay. Some of them have been reading him uh, closely over the past uh, few years, and some of them have been uh, reading them and discussing them in the past uh, two years or two semesters, and so on. So, but they, anyway, they have their own uh, background, their own uh, knowledge frame, uh, or other colonial theories and other local knowledges and local projects and uh, local uh, agenda or problematics. So. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce them to you and uh, Professor Mignolo, and uh, let's uh, start from their talk. I just sit here, otherwise I'll, uh, I'll be moving around, and uh, Walter uh, will be sitting here later on. Okay? Yeah. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Professor Mignolo for this very rich and uh, important lecture that you gave today. Uh, my name is Hui Yu Tan. I'm currently writing uh, my doctoral thesis and the topic is uh, I'm writing I'm writing on um, the Chen Jieren who is the contemporary uh, Taiwanese artist and my topic is uh, equality of intelligence. So uh, I'll, I'll just go uh, go straight to my questions raised to Professor Minolo. So, uh, 
I asked three questions. The first question will be uh, specific to the lecture today uh, on uh, sustainable, sustainable economy. And the second question will be a more general question to uh, your overall uh, conception of the decolon coloniality. And my third question will be very short and specific. Uh, okay, so uh, my first question. Uh, in the paper, uh, in, the, in the lecture you gave today, uh, I agree with your differentiation of sustainable development from sustainable economy. Uh, I think it is crucial to make this differentiation. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the so-called Sustainable development, while continue pursuing economic growth, can never really criticize. Can never can never really criticize the power of the power of global finance and developmentalism. Uh, so what is left to us is simply the environmental issues. Uh, environmental issues such as global warming is indeed happening on the planet. Uh, it is also a way or a fake subject to cover up more, e more crucial issues. So compared to this, what you gave us the concept of sustainable economies uh, allow us to imagine a, a whole different picture, a whole different way of living from developmentalist pursuits. But, however, my question is, um, in the idea of the coloniality you developed, and specifically in today's lecture, you mentioned Latin American uh, cosmologies, which is, uh, which is uh, to simply put, uh, the communal values of indigenous people, can serve as an important resource to imagine uh, a better system, a better world, beyond Western modernity. Uh, but my question to this is, uh, the indigenous system or values that you suggest we can rely on, how will it be possible not to become simply a alternative value or simply an alternative choice within the society of late capitalism. Because it seems to me that we are not lacking those values or choices offered by uh, late, cap late capitalism society. In other words, uh, indigenous values might have already been subsumed or provided as something alternative by uh, the late capitalism society. So put the question further, or more specific, uh, which is where, where is, uh, where is this imaginable? I mean, where is this indigenous communal value imaginable beyond uh, those cultural spaces, such as such as uh, art galleries, museums, so on. So, uh, yeah, that was my first question. So my second question, uh, my second question would be uh, concern your idea of colonial matrix of power uh, that, you, that you elaborate in uh, last week's lecture. Uh, you state that the colonial matrix of power, <coughs> CMP, as a complex, uh, sorry, that, that is what you uh, wrote, uh, quote, colonial matrix of power as a, quote, complex structure of management and control composed of uh, domains, levels, and flows, end quote, and, uh, quote, of making visible what is invisible, end quote. And it is a concept developed in the third world uh, in the struggle for decolonization in Asia and Africa. Uh, in other words, the idea of colonial matrix of power closely engages with history 
uh, history of devastation and exploitation by the imperialist and Western or modern system and values. So this is what your lecture uh, gave us. For this, uh, I have no doubt with. Uh, so uh, nevertheless, uh, so my question would be, uh, if, if I to raise my question from uh, the reality I'm facing, I mean, specifically from my generation, and this has to be a concern for today's new form of exploitation by mobile technology. To take example, uh, a very concrete and empirical example, to have food delivery through, through your apps on the mobile phone, right, uh, is now a new form, a new form of delivery system that employs gigantic number of manpower. And it also it is also a new system that uses very, very large number of dispatched labor, dispatched workers, meaning workers without any social safety. Um, so in China, these systems are rapidly growing. There are applications called such as uh, Are You Hungry? Uh, <laughs> And also in Taiwan and many other countries around the globe, there, there are Uber, there are Uber Eats, etc. those applications. So, uh, and as we know, China, they have their own apps, they have their own application by using the Westerns. And this trend of employee, employing these patch workers uh, not only take place in food delivery service, but uh, many others, such as moving service, cleaning service, etc. Uh, so dispatch labor is now becoming a more and more common way of employment. So what I'm trying to ask is, the new form of uh, technology, or the new form of mobile technology, might be from the West, or more specifically, from Silicon Valley in California, but the exploitation may or may not be from the West. Okay. So if I go back to the idea of a colonial matrix of power, where you put uh, in your description as complex structure of management and control, composed of domains, levels, and flows. Uh, so for me, uh, so for me, this colonial, what I have in picture is, is no longer specifically to the West, but could be, uh, it could be the matrix of power of, of multi-faceted dominator, dominator, ruler, and uh, logistics of the globe. And this is the reality that me and my generation is facing. So my question may as well uh, link to uh, Alan Boza's question raised last week. Uh, how should we make this delinking or decolonial our own? Maybe we can say uh, technology is something from the West Thus, is in inevitably a product of Western system and value. But, but to me, to attribute everything happening in today's reality to Western value or Western domination is kind of a uh, too easy a blame or too much a simplification of the matrix of power of today's world. Uh, so the above will be my second question. And my third question is very short and specific uh, to Professor Minolo. Uh, we know that you have, you have different conception of geopolitics from, uh, from that of David Harvey's. Can you, uh, can you please elaborate more on this differentiation? <laughs> so that will be my question. Thank you very much.
because I agree with whatever most of what you say but then I will remember I will go through some of the lines and some of the points that you have uh, mentioned in the talk and uh, in your paper too and then simultaneously I will ask the questions uh, according to that okay so to begin with uh, you start talking about the sustained uh, conversation on the concepts of development and both at sustainable and unsustainable, and living in harmony and peace, uh, which is further elaborated and explained in terms of sustainable economy. Uh, however, I felt that there was uh, more room uh, left for briefly dis defining the term uh, sustainable economy, because we are so used to sustainable development that it's very easy for us to mix it, both the terms, and differentiate it like what we are talking about and where we are and where we should go. So this is my first thing. And as I learned, the primary aim of a sustainable economy is to produce local economies. Those are economically viable, environmentally sound, and socially equal. Recently, a number of petty uh, sustainable economies have erupted in various corners of the world, but too tiny to make a difference, and thus completely turn the world uh, the whole development process, I mean, upside down. Uh, the paper also calls for the imagination of different forms of governance and economy parallel to but detached from the system of ideas, beliefs, emotions, and most importantly, institutions, uh, under which these uh, development, I suppose the rough and that is unsustainable and sustainable, have been and are being, are being taught out and implemented. So uh, here is a question that comes to my mind. That does it mean that the modern concept of nation state formations that we are talking about so much now will uh, collapse under sustainable economies? Uh, this is a question that I thought. So <laughs> I totally agree to the idea that sustainable development in either form has created more problems than solutions because of the growing inequality, exploitation, and growing economic gap between different classes of people within the same social framework uh, can be seen as the most ex important example because this is what uh, capitalism has brought, has brought to us, just like you mentioned. Okay, so it can also be agreed that sustainable economy free us from the trap of th thinking than development and Sustainable economies are different, more effective options. The real goals are to eliminate poverty and inequality. But uh, uh, will the whole world be able to effectively come up with this solution? Because we, live, we are already living in a world where nations are, have been uh, since long divided now. It's divided uh, as developed, developing and underdeveloped based on economic process, progress and development because you say society is a part of economy now and not the other way around. So how can we imagine breaking these barriers and continue with delinking and sustaining at the same time? Because it is, the whole system is already divided. So interestingly, while citing the problem of development and how it privileges the economic sphere over all other spheres of life, the most important consequence comes into limelight, limelight, that is development is a transformation of the senses, beliefs, and sensibilities of the population trapped in the rhetoric that you have mentioned. But having more is better and being fast and not wasting time is preferable to going slow. That is what you said. So, um, the fact that crisis is not only economic, but it is ethical is absolutely true and real. Uh, and this is the reason that maybe we are talking about it today. And as you mentioned uh, in the text that according to NG, 
international law has been a fundamental instrument holding together the colonial metrics of power. Dewesternization disputes the control of the colonial metrics of power and requires changing the content and not the terms of the conversation. So I believe it won't be very easy for continents like Asia and Africa to successfully incorporate the sustainability and to come up with sustainable e economies and live in harmony while some of the most powerful international law gets operated by the Western powers like US even today. It is not certain that China wants to be the only manager. Uh, what is clear that China doesn't want to be managed anymore, that is what you quoted. And this feeling is growing among other countries too. Uh, I completely uh, agree to that, but there are, uh, there are points that I want to mention here. Um, but China's growing economic might is also seen as a threat by other Asian nations now. Uh, for example, the other neighboring countries, China's aggressive territorial expansion is forcing the less powerful Asian nations to see China as the unbeatable power of the East. The India-China issues, for example, or China-Taiwan issues we can take can be taken as examples of this. Uh, for example, China has taken the advantage of its economic superiority by providing economic support and boosting sustainable development in countries like, like less uh, economically developed countries like uh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. And most importantly, the number of investors uh, investors from China has been coming to these uh, countries to invest and grow. Now, China's con constant domination has led to an unpeaceful relationship between India and its neighbors. I'm talking about the present scenario. So how China is able to do this is because of its economic development, while we are talking about a different kind of sustainability at the same time. So recently a delegation, this is an uh, incident that I want to share here, recently a delegation of government officials from Taiwan's ruling political party went to India for extending the gesture of friendship and economic uh, growth uh, between the two countries. And India as an emerging uh, economy in Asia is also uh, attracting a lot of investors. So, but within a few days of this uh, delegation, we get the news that China is upset about this meeting between Taiwanese government representatives and Indian members. The leading, uh, lead, one of the leading newspapers of India uh, quoted saying that China is furious and is warning India of being insensible and childish because uh, India is trying to um, break the law and trying to merge into a friendship with Taiwan. If it wants to have a dialogue with China, with Taiwan, then it should go through the government representative in Beijing and not directly through Taiwan. So these kinds of gestures, those have been born with, with development that is economically will so will China ever opt for sustainability without development of any form to lose its power? So of course, I agree that we can say that de-Westernization has started between West and non-West, for example, Asia. But what has started with examples like China is a dominance of a different kind. So how can we imagine this situation in the future? And the ideas that more is better, faster is better is the problem because this generates competitions and conflict among groups of people. Sustainable development cannot solve the present problems of sustainability and ecological issues, which is truly sad. Uh, after, a long history, uh, after a long history of sustainable development, will the emerging sustainable economies be able to stick with their principle of sustainability and net, not development? Because the paper argues that sustainable economies are primarily concerned about sustainability while they totally reject the idea of development. Sustainable economies are the economies that make it possible to live in harmony, plenitude, and caring. So what I want to say is, will we be, because we also see that there were many promises being made along with sustainable development. So can we, uh, will we be able to stick with the principles that we are talking in here. And every concept and process holds a saturation point at some level or the other. Although I can imagine some years of sustainability, of equality, and harmony, 
but I can't imagine the process of sustainability to continue to the elder end of this planet. Uh, I think something will change at the end. So lastly, I would like to highlight the case of India with great diversity, where every region is a little world in itself with greatly different ethnically, culturally, economically groups of people. The country holds the history of being a British colony for over 100 years and is called a democratic nation in the present times. A nation of utmost multiculturalism and coloniality, how can we imagine a society like this to emerge with economic sustainability and detach itself from norms of state and institutions? Moreover, what will be the position of the large number of vulnerable refugees and illegal migrants, immigrants, sorry, residing within the borders of India when development turns into sustainability? This was my last question. Thank you so much. Very good. Uh, thank you, Punam. So, O, would you continue? Yes. Uh, uh, oh, you were picking the谢谢教授我在灵魂本里面得到的一点启发发明了新大陆之后呢都是位于不同的殖民权力结构里面当这种扩张的西方化的知识那到目前为止但是你在书里面也提到了说
。那在整个帝国设计，就是在推动这种现代性的同时，把这种殖民性的社会管理纳入其中。那所以我会想，在你这边呢，就是以上的，就是概念上面来重新思考，就是关于那个解殖民的思考，就是呃，基本上就是呃，我们呃。其实，在很多的，就是像台湾的，其实这样的地方，就是我们脱离了殖民主义的治理，但是也是无法避免这种殖民性的内在治理。但是，呃，就是台湾，它其实在一个历史结构上面，它其实有很复杂的历史结构。然后，所以我也在思考说，就是在台湾本土上面，它有没有一个可以作为一个。去殖民化的参照点，就是特别我们可能现在面临的很多，就是呃，比如在台台湾独立的思想下面，就是我们会有所谓的去中国化的思想等等。那这再是我第一个问题，然后再来第二个部分呢，是关于就是呃，就是我自己最近的研究题目的思考，就是呃，我呃正在思考就是中国革命到印度革命之间的关系。那呃，在你的书里面其实有提到，就是呃，现代性它其实有不同的阶段，就是可能过去它是一个神学的传统，然后最后呢进到了一个政治经济学的叙事。那你也提出了，就是你认为呃，马克思的原始积累基本上是一种欧洲现代性叙事的观点，就是你认为其实这里面有两种原始积累，一种是欧洲封建主义生产方式转向资本主义生产方式。但另外一种是美洲大陆的非西方的生产方式被纳入了殖民掠夺的生产方式，但是你觉得好像第三世界的知识分子都自动的，就是接受了这种，就是呃一种原始阶级的论述，就我们就被纳入了整个现代殖民的叙事，然后所以大家都接受了这种谈法。然后在这里面呢，我其实在思考的事情是，就是。呃，其实，在整个左翼思想，它其实对整个第三世界的知识解放，它其实是一个呃很重要的思想资源，就是呃，包括就是，例如以中国或印度这两个呃地方来讲，他们其实当时的马克思思想主要是作为一个就是反帝国跟反封建的，就是反对过去封建传统的一个重要的思想工具。那如果在今天，就是因为其实现在在印度的。就是丛林里面的男友，就是呃抵抗新自由主义的毛派革命分子。那就是就是，如果我们都要把这些现代性的叙事，它基本上都是架空的话，那我们怎么样回到？就是一个我们很难回到过去的知识传统，但是又没办法再往前进。那那个第三世界的知识道路会是怎么往下走？那再来最后一个。就是呃，我的想法是呃，关于呃，就是教授其实谈到很多就是呃，印度原呃印加的原住民的问题。嗯、呃，基本上台湾它本身也是有原住民。那呃，台湾原住民它其实是一个被汉人跟西方双重殖民下的地方。就是例如现在的原住民部落，他们基本上是有呃，就是基督教或天主教的信仰，但是他们同时还保留他们原来的祖灵信仰。但是他们呃，因为他们跟汉人的生活，所以他们其实目前他们想要去掉汉化的这种意图，强强烈意图，其实胜过要去西方化的。那例如他们其实最近，其实在台湾的原住民，他们有一个主张划设传统领域的，就是提案。但是呃，这种关于土地上面的争议，它就会跟整个资本主义的私有财产制，它其实是互相抵触。那这也是我觉得目前这种第三世界它在解殖民这种复杂的地复杂之处，就是呃，它如何如果这个资本主义的体制它本身无法被打破的话，那他们其实即使他们想要回到过去的传统，他们其实也是一个很艰难的道路。就是我的问题。Thank you very much, Bo. Uh, so, uh, visa no auto. 
I was not here, I would probably have been doing development studies somewhere, it is obvious. Uh, so, and I feel that uh, now is a really good time to interrogate uh, the idea or the notion of development, uh, primarily because the uh, fog of market fundamentalism and neoliberal consensus has been lifted to a very great extent. And we see an ongoing crisis, not just in global south, but uh, in global north as well. At least, finally, they acknowledge that they are going through crisis. So, interesting times. Uh, for a really long time, the idea of development has operated uh, both as a cognitive category and a relationship of force that has marked and remarked territories uh, mapped by the colonial encounter. And uh, as you said, we really need to understand that uh, the paradigm of development is coded in the grammar of uh, colonialism. Uh, it's just a, a centuries-old variation of uh, what has been called uh, saving humanity, white man's burden, civilization, civilizing mission. Sorry. And as you mentioned in your book, the historical imperative of progress. Uh, so it's just not a theory of growth, uh, which is like which is how commonly people understand it, but rather an ideological and institutional construct for the domination of global north over global south. So, um, in a way, it's just a way of thinking, right? Uh, and once consolidated, this way of thinking, it determines what can be thought, said, imagined. Uh, and that's why I think that what you said about uh, knowledge of coloniality is quite interesting here. Uh, because right now, development has become a full-blown operation. Like, not even that. It's an entire enterprise which uh, dictates the term of uh, space, society, individual, good, bad, what is right, abnormal, you name it. Uh, it dictates the term of knowledge, of imagination, language, and after listening to you, I would say uh, it dictates the term of our own very, of our being. So, uh, so it, because it dictates all that, it also dictates the term of intervention. Uh, and sustainable development, well, just, just a development the idea of development uh, packed in a better, flowery, beautiful terms, I feel. And I mean, for, it's been there for a long time, right? Like 25 years or more. And it has been held as the supposed so solution to the world's problem. But what we see is more pollution, more poverty, uh, more climate loss, uh, biodiversity loss, and climate change. The concept has been abused so much, it's ridiculous. And uh, I, mean, I mean, how many more signs do we need that it's just like that we need to stop, that we're not going about it the right way? Apparently, uh, still more signs to come. Uh, however, this of course, does not mean the concept is redundant. Um, as you mentioned, uh, sustainable development is a concept to, uh, very, to which very few people would object. And most would agree that we should not live as if there was no tomorrow. Uh, but the term has become like an elastic rubber band that can be stretched by anyone and anyone at its own will. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the critique of development is an arena of intense political and intellectual conflict. Like, uh, to be honest, when I wrote this, I didn't hear that um, the actual field of battle lies outside conventional institutes such as universities and parties. But I think after listening to your talk, I think I can revise the idea that maybe that university can be an actual battlefield to like change the idea of development. Uh, and I will progress to that later why I think that. Uh, I feel that the dissenting voice are at the grassroots, and these are the voices that we don't listen to and that are being submerged under the polarizing conversation on development. Um, and that is why I like your idea of changing not just the content, uh, but the terms of conversation. And I like the idea mostly because I can relate to it personally. Uh, prior to being here, I used to work for an international um, NGO that used to work for um, development, development uh, needs of uh, indigenous community, communities of Himalayan region, India and Nepal, and it did a lot of work in Africa as well, East Africa. So when we would go there to the site, to the communities, uh, we would see a balance or a need for balance between uh, growth and sustainability. And I am only using the word sustainability here because uh, English language falls short for like a better alternative term for development. So this is we are what we're stuck with. Uh, more or less, I think your term Pachamama, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Pachamama? 
Pachamama, uh, yes, sorry. So, yeah, I think your term would cover it more or less, the idea of development that they were seeking. Uh, but uh, uh, this does not mean that obviously they were not looking for economic growth or development, but rather a different form of development that I can't even conceptualize right now. Uh, so when I read your article, I could just relate to it instantly, like I know what you're trying to say. Uh, however, in my experience, it does not mean that there are not uh, pitfalls for this form of development. For, and I'm, I'm going to practice, practice here the troubles that I faced while, while I was working with the communities. So there was always this conflict with the approach and the approach prescribed by the hegemonic notion of development. Uh, and a lot of time, not even a lot, yeah, majority of the time, the, invariably the hegemonic discourse would win. Uh, there, are, there are so many reasons for them. Primarily because the interventionist, that would be us as an NGO, the interventionist would operate within the hegemonic discourse. So we are, I would say, in the closet. And that's the problem. So basically it was coloniality within coloniality when we're talking about decolonization. So, so how, my first question would be, how do you think we can reconcile with this? I mean, we always try to like strive, like we always talk about balance, like we, and even when, talk, when you're talking about sustainable economies, uh, we're talking about balance or a different form. But this way of hegemonic uh, development, the hegemonic discourse is so much that you know when you're doing, um, when you're striving to make a change on ground, the hegemonic discourse always wins. And another thing would be, uh, and this is the problem with development developmental intervention everywhere, like everywhere like, that I come across. The problem of funding. Um, uh, and a major source of funding for NGOs are um, organizations such as UN, World Bank, and other corporate, uh, corporate funded organizations such as uh, Bill Gates organization, just, to, um, just an example. And when these corporations, they strive to make an effort, it comes with the liability of neoliberal agenda. Uh, despite what they say, in my experience, there has always been something they're trying to achieve, a particular goal which falls within the hegemonic development discourse. Anything too contradictory is rejected as being silly or being not, just, just whatever you name it, it would be rejected if it's not written in their terms. And I've written enough research grants to know that. So how can we have a meaningful in inter in intervention when these contradictory forces are operating. Uh, I mean, whatever we get, like whatever we get from them, or whatever the, uh, um, the benefit that we incur, it's just a tame down of version of what can be and what should be. So I would like your comment on that. Um, and another thing, how do we, uh, it's not there, so it's just thought of that. <laughs> How do we uh, articulate the language of intervention or language of development? Because what we say here is policy of language, because English language is just not um, competent, I would, I would say competent enough to articulate what those people need, what people, like indigenous communities or other people who are in need of development need. So that would be another question. Like, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, so, Shi Jun Ling uh, will be the last. He could have uh, spoken in French, <laughs> because uh, his French might be better than English, but that will be bad for our audience here. So he will still be uh, speaking in Mandarin, right? And then we have our interpretation, right? Oh, I'm <laughs> Partition of the sense of the part of the no, of no part. 
，如果说 partition of the sensible， 来自于福克有关呃知识型的分析，呃，因此对我来说 ，the partition of the sensible 首先意味着一种真理体制，既普遍又本质式的生活方式。面对这样的真理体制。公司业诉求 the power of the no power， 在共同体之中，呃，没有在共同体之中却没有权利的人来进行对抗。我认为这两个概念应该很符合教授所要探讨的问题。其中最主要大概是会是 develop、呃、development 跟呃 sustain sustain economy 之间的对比。如果再扩张一点，大概会是 d e v e l o p m e n t a l i z a t i o n 跟 development 之间的差异。呃，上述这些，那应该就是所谓的知，呃，来自殖民时期的知识霸权，也就是，呃，经济发展挂帅的生活方式。这个观点被认为是普遍的又本质的，也就是所谓的真理体制。为了对抗这种体制，呃，教授呃诉求 d e c o l o n i a l i t y 也就是说 ，the the part of the no part， 由此在对话中改变的可能就不只是 content， 而更是 turn 的问题。嗯，关于教上述呃教授提出的看法，我相当同意。毕竟，生活方式本来就不只是一种样貌而存在。而这里要，这里就产生我想提出的问题：教授关于生活方式的分析，似乎给予呃经济层面比较多的关注，而对于认同仪式却比较少琢磨。但就我自己的阅读来说，在所谓的去西方的生活模式中，认同仪式会不断的出现。例如中国的现代化，我很想知道教授在分析去西方时是如何看待殖民地认同的仪式。如果再具体一点的话，呃，去西方是否包含去认同？就像刚才教授讲的，呃，教授分析反动时讲的，黑人性 Negro 是西方的发发明，所以而这也牵连到教授说的 g e o p o l i t i c a l knowledge。因为就我认知，领土在现代国族形成的过程中占有很重要的地位。嗯，这是我第一个问题。然后第二个问题是，呃，从呃在现代来看，我们可以看到现现代很多极右派的兴起，然后教授又教授，同时教授认为这个这个时代是所谓的去西方化的时代。我也想知道说。这两个去西方跟极右派的兴起有没有之间的之间有没有关系？就是说，越去越去西方化，然后极右呃文明差异、文明的冲突越来越激烈。这之前所谓的去西方化的方呃分析方式，是不是还有一些我们需要去关注的点？然后最后的问题是，所谓资本主义式的生活是不是都不好的？因为就我知道，这样的生活方式曾经带来殖民地。妇女的解放运动，这是我三个问题。谢谢。Okay, thank you, uh, Lin. So, Walter, would you not like to come yeah. here? But would you like to wait for other questions from the floor, or would you like to? I think we should kind of address this. Address first, yeah. quickly, and then we open up. So. Otherwise, we'll forget. So, uh, I try to be brief, uh, but uh, to address at least one of the issues of each. Uh, oh, so thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much to all of you. So, um, I think we will uh, start with the beginning. <laughs> I, I didn't. I cannot pronounce your name. And, <laughs> Number one. So um, I will highlight um, what you said. You are right. I mean, uh, China is today is as guilty of exploitation of labor as the West, right? So that's what I mean. That de-westernization is not challenging the colonial nature of power is disputing who controls it. Um, so if there is carbon pollution I mean, uh, chi uh, in, in China, well, uh, what are the options of China? So you really surrender or compete? Uh, so that is what the westernization uh, means. And in a sense, it's related to the question of identity, of national identity. 
So national identity is not something that existed since God, whatever God you like, uh, created the world. National identity is a very modern, and in this sense, second modernity, uh, 19th century, the creation of bourgeois nation state. Because if you go um, a few centuries before, it was not a national identity. The communities were not community of natio, were communities of believers, right? Uh, so national identity is a creation of the second modernity of the rhetoric of modernity. So once uh, the idea of national identity emerged in Europe with the uh, nation state and kind of put the church uh, uh, in the second, second row, what decolonization during the Cold War trying to do, as we said the other day, to send the colonizer home and create our own national identity. And I think that uh, national identity is deadly. It's a very, and this is the problem of the state, who might not remember you mentioned the problem of the state. Because as we said the first day, nation state care for the national, not for the human being. So that is national security, right, that we are now. Uh, so that touches the question of technology, uh, So I mean, I think that China now uh, is facing the problem of creating a technology that responds to their own needs, rather than adapting the technology that, that has been created to respond to a different need, to the Silicon Valley, right? So, but this is the dispute for the control of the colonial metric of power. And you see that in the military. So Russia and China are putting, and Trump are putting more money, I mean, and this is technology, but this technology to kind of enhance military power. So the westernization has the same, uh, I mean, it's not, it's not disputing the, it's not, uh, it's not changing the, uh, the colonial measure of power, I, I repeat, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's disputing who, who controls it. So that's, um, um, there was another point here. Oh, and there is another thing, another important point I didn't talk yet, but that crosses the whole history of 500 years of Western control of the colonial nature power and continues today in the Westernization. And this is the dispensability or disposability of human life. Once you create an economy that focus on growth and wealth, you don't care about life. You don't care about human life between the 16th and the 18th century, and you don't care about the life of the planet after the Industrial Revolution. So the dispensability or disposability of human life is an economic category. But that goes together uh, with the other um, concept of naked life or bare life. So bare life is a political concept. It's a political concept that deprives people of their state a right to the nation state. So uh, it, I, I think it's very important to make this kind of distinction. So what we're talking today that, uh, that uh, is slavery continuum, why? Because the principle continuum. Dispensable people, if we just use it. Huh? A slave there or a slave here. So there are different kind of configuration, but dispensability. And that is the problem for refugees and immigrants and the war. Uh, in Israel and the wall uh, in, uh, that Trump wants to, it's not, I mean, the, the China wall is, it was a different time, it was a different configuration, but was, uh, 
So that the dispensability of human life is also uh, evaluated for China. So I am not defending the westernization. I say the westernization is no longer the Cold War and Marxism against capitalism. It's capitalism against capitalism, uh, so to speak. Well, that is, um, so in relation to what you were saying, uh, is, uh, yeah, um, I think I already uh, kind of addressed the question of the state, the nation state. Um, but there is another question that when, uh, so how can, how can sustainable economy become hegemonic? Well, I don't know. I mean, uh, so I am grateful that today we can start thinking about this. I was given the example the other day, that I think I don't remember here or in Taipei. I was given the example of two Martians that uh, in the 13th century, uh, first came one from Mars, uh, was sent to kind of investigate, and then two months later, the boss came. Uh, so, and this, this Martian came very, very intelligent. Uh, they went to Italy. So they were kind of uh, inspecting Genoa, and Florence, and Venice that were the kind of commercial center. <laughs> right? They were commerce with North Africa, the Silk Road, huh? right? Uh, and so, the, so the, the first one is looking at that, what is happening there, the second one comes. And he said, well, what did you discover? I said, well, me. You see those two guys chatting there uh, in that corner that nobody is listening to them? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what is those guys? In three centuries, they will take over the world. So that they were the bourgeois, what we call the bourgeoisie. So how could somebody imagine in 13th century that the monarchy and the church could be overcome by the emerging class? Now, there is a difference here, and this is very, very important. Uh, that within the colonial measure of power and within the kind of the hegemony that is building in the West, the bourgeoisie displaced the monarchy and the church. Now, that bourgeoisie expands all over the world. So what is emerging is that kind of energy of free existence that do not want to be dictated how to live. There is collaboration. There is always collaboration. And so there are small states that collaborate with the big state on one way or another. But there is a lot of people who do not want to collaborate. They want to the link. So that is the energy that is, is emerging. So investors, so how you how that become hegemonic? I don't know. I am very happy with the fact that there are energy the linking from westernization and de-westernization. Right? Uh, not from the West, but also from kind of the China uh, that you are so. So the question of the investor is the question of uh, development. So in a, in a sustainable economy, you don't need investors, right? So the question is, how do you think this is a, it's a total departure, and, and we have the freedom to depart. Again, with, without the hope that the current state and the current investor and the current capitalist will listen to us. And we don't want to be listening to them, uh, I mean, by them. So that's kind of tricky. So you were saying that it's all absorbed by capitalism. There are cracks. There are cracks in capitalism. And the question of how people began to organize themselves is very difficult because, I mean, the state and the investor and the corporation and the uh, uh, extractivism, they are always trying to get the land of the indigenous people or the land of not indigenous people, but the land of peasants who can no longer sustain the economy and so they take the land and send the 
and, 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 and send the patient to New York or to Beijing or to where they live miserable, uh, miserably, but they, lo they lost the land. So, and they know it. Everybody knows it. So the, the struggle is already there and multiplying around the world, but without hope at this point, perhaps in 300 years. <laughs> Uh, but I don't think that we, we can think of the decolonization as a kind of what will happen next week. <laughs> I think that the, the, the modesty is what we can do to leave a seed to the future generation, you, well, your generation will suffer this kind of the consequences. And let me say something about uh, you being a student at that time. I think for me it's very easy to talk about this kind of thing because I'm a senior professor and I have tenure. <laughs> right? Uh, you have to go through that. So my, not advice, but my suggestion, I cannot tell you what you want to do, I mean, that you decide. But if you want to follow that road, you have to know how to play poker. Yeah. You, have, you have to know when to fold it. So. If you know where you're going, you have to know how to go in through a system that you don't doesn't want you to go that way. Uh, but you can often say, "Well, I want to go that way, and I don't care what you think about it." That's another option. Yeah. So that's that is kind of the linking, and, and you will find other people. But if you want to go through the university, don't expect that the Mellon Foundation will give you a to do this kind of thing, <laughs> right? You don't ask the Mellon Foundation to do this kind of thing. I don't ask, I, I don't apply for that. I don't I, I work in other ways, but I have stopped applying for grant for 25, 30 years. I don't want your money, I don't need your money, because there is a lot of things you can do with very little money. It's just to will, to do it, to get together with other people uh, and do things. Yeah, that's, uh, what else? Okay. <laughs> uh, the question of Taiwan, Mars, is an indigenous. <laughs> um, uh, Yeah, I, I, I am aware, um, I, I mentioned the first day that you here in Taiwan, another small, uh, I mean, I talk about small state because there is a guy in Hong Kong who write about small state. Um, I don't remember his name. Brian something. Um, so yeah, there, Taiwan is kind of afraid of China. Duterte like to go to China. And Myanmar is kind of, a, so the question, the question is um, that within liberalization, you have to keep in mind that China, I'm not defending China, but just pay attention that China is in a double bind. Because China still is under Western domination. I mean, still the West is, can not dictate, but can uh, put some kind of difficulties, and that is what Jinping is trying to overcome. So in that sense, China is in the double bind. Uh, like Russia. Huh? <coughs> kind of Madina Sosanova right about the uh, the Janus face and pipe. <laughs> right? That the Russia has the yeah, yeah, they are trying to kind of control it, but at the same time, they are you see what happened now to China with the West. While for the West, the West, the preoccupation that the West have with China and Russia is to keep on controlling them. And for us in South America, United States is similar to China in the East, right? Uh, so that is the complexity of de-Westernization at this moment. And the fact that de-Westernization allows a smaller state, like for example, in Latin America in, 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 in the past, I mean, in the present, Bolivia, Ecuador, Argentina, Venezuela, they have the option of going to Iran, to Russia, and to China to kind of uh, 
not to be swallowed by the uh, United States. So that is the complexity of uh, the westernization, while decoloniality is, as I said, <laughs> how do you do it? Well, you have to figure it out. I don't have, uh, I, don't, I mean, nobody have, uh, nobody have a kind of uh, blueprint. So decoloniality starts by, by understanding, especially in our, uh, because we are not peasant, uh, we are not indigenous, uh, we are not kind of uh, African diaspora, or some maybe the African diaspora. Many of us are not the African diaspora. So you have to figure out where you have been located. And then you have to start working, how can I deal with that? So, the, the, so for us, knowledge is, uh, is very, very important. I go back to the question of identity. It's not just, you see, the national identity is what I refer to, but I wanna, re I wanna talk a little bit about identity. Identity is identification. Identity is how the rhetoric of modernity creates the ontology and makes you believe who I am. I have no idea who I am. Uh, but I do have a clear idea how I was identified. How I was identified in Argentina, how I was identified in France, how I was identified in the United States. So once you understand that the question of identity, and this is a concept I didn't mention, but it's very important, it's a question of classification. So how you have been classified, and who classified? He, 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 <laughs> with big H, he who control knowledge, right? They have the, so classification, sociogenesis, that is what Fanon realized. Sociogenesis is a classification. I have been classified as an ego, right? So the question of identity is, uh, is in the modern colonial world, is how we have been classified racially, sexually, nationally, by region, by country, third world countries, for example. This is a racist classification. Third world is a racist classification. Second world is a racist classification. Emerging nation and economy is a racist classification. Don't think about racism as it's just applying to certain people. Racism is the knowledge and the technology of making whatever, region, people, inferior. Because you can, and that is the westernization, the identity. The westernization is fighting against that, not just economically and politically, but affirming the identific their own identification and not to be identified as yellow people. But, uh, which was the, class the classification from Linnaeus and Kant. <coughs> well, um, you know, I, I, gave a, uh, I gave a seminar, a two-week seminar in Chilion, uh, two years ago, and there were 22 students from all over India. Man, I had difficulties understanding English Indian. <laughs> I, I got to kind of have a translator. Uh, there were some, there were three or four students who translated for me. <laughs> the other. Uh, so I don't know if I can get to the point uh, that you were uh, raising. Well, one I think I, I think has addressed the, the kind of the neoliberal agenda, the funding, and all these kind of things, right? Um, so, decolonially, we will not apply. As, not only I don't want to, I don't want their money. I don't want them to do, to know what they're going to do. Because if I present, I, I can disguise my project, etc. But once they, they gave me the grant, then they had to report. So they hooked me. So thank you, I don't, but I mean. Um, so the question of languages and the question of knowledge, right, that you, uh, this is the other point that, well that for me is very, very crucial in our, uh, in our, because I speak English, but I think in Spanish. It's not that I think in Spanish and I translate in English. I think in Spanish because my body was forced in Spanish. 
I mean, not in the Spanish Peninsula, Spain, in the Spanish of Argentina. So when I, when I talk about the languaging, it's not that you know a grammar. You inhabit. You are a language. So in that sense, I use the grammar of English to the best of my knowledge. But not, I don't use the, the grammar of Spanish. But I don't fit in the United States as, an, as, as a gringo. Why? Well, because uh, between Argentina and France, I lived 28 years out of the United States. When I went to the United States, I missed the, all, the 24 years that people of our generation live in the United States. I listened to Elvis Presley in Argentina. So Elvis Presley in, in the United States was something different. And talking to the, the people of my generation who live with you, I mean, who grow up with the Beatles, with the Rolling Stones, with Elvis Presley, I, I heard all of these guys in Argentina. So the, that experience. So that is the question. It's not just knowledge, but senses. So emotion, and that is something that we emotion according to how we have been shaped in our sensibility in the place we have been uh, born, raised, educated, etc. And that I think is very, very, very important. I mean, emotionally comes first. Reasoning that the modernity trying to believe that suppress emotion and reasoning always follows emotion. You don't convince anybody by arguments. If that person, there is not something that that person sense in his or her emotion that what you are saying touch him or her. So that's another twist of kind of the uh, the decolonial emotion govern our reason and not uh, the other way around. Well, there is a lot to talk about, but I hope that I have uh, addressed some of the of the issues. Yeah. Well, you can continue. Um, I want to thank you for this lecture and I just wanted to raise sort of two small points that were inspired by um, Fiza's comments and I wanted to touch on language and sort of the psychology behind CMP and I think throughout this lecture and sort of a short conversation with my friends I've kind of been feeling that language and psychology are the hidden fulcrum of the CMP because I find that when it comes to language we have a way to articulate what is Western ideas, what are Western knowledge, what are the institutions. We have this whole sort of foundation for the CMP. But when it comes to understanding indigenous knowledges, it's the general indigenous knowledge. We don't have these sort of structures in English that can match up. So then English always becomes dominant, Western concepts and ideologies become dominant, and then it seems that when we argue for decoloniality, decoloniality is losing in this fight if we're continuing to speak in English and continuing to use these concepts that we've come to know, you know, as Western concepts. And when it comes to psychology, just on my own personal opinion, I feel that this battle of de-Westernization and decolonization versus decoloniality is really the greater fight because I feel that for those people who have been oppressed, they now feel that they're in a position that's better than the past when they were previously colonized. So then they feel that they can then readopt the, the perceived power of coloniality and then use that to sort of push aside their oppression and then elevate themselves. However, they don't necessarily understand the full structure of the CMP. So my question, and I think the question for maybe our generation is, how do we convince people to let go of this perceived power of coloniality? How do we convince people that 
this is not the future and that they will in turn become oppressors if they continue on to this route. And if people don't want to let go of this power, then what do we do? I think we're going to be stuck in this perpetual de-Westernization, de sinocization de-whatever comes next. I think we're never going to leave this sort of oppressive bubble that we live in. And maybe it's just oppression as a whole that we're sort of fighting here. Uh, introduce yourself briefly, yeah, so that we know your uh, background. Oh, um, my name is Frantz Elvi Banda, and I'm a student at National Chungju University in Zanta, yeah. and I study um, international affairs. Okay. Good. Very good. For the second question, um, uh, Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for your brilliant speech and lecture. I'm Philip Kraus, uh, just a uh, fresh gra PhD graduate from this department. And uh, I have several comments, and I hope I can make two questions at the end, or maybe during my, my, my comments. First of all, of course, as I told you last time, we are on the same uh, side of the barricade. So on the, I really like uh, your critical thinking within your, your thesis. But at the moment, when you turn to be a little bit more positive, I will immediately disagree. I am from Czech Republic, uh, so we already have a little bit experience with something what may be called as a sustainable economy. Okay? That's actually the plain economy, in a sense. Of course, uh, at that moment, uh, we do not give up the myth of the development and the modernization. But basically speaking, what was that system about? It was about the redistribution of the wealth among, among the people. So uh, I'm, I have been born in 1973. So I still remember the golden age of the Czech Republic Socialism in 1990s, 1980s. Actually, people have pretty good life. Uh, it's unimaginable that you would be unemployed. It's almost unimaginable that you will be lack of the social security. Uh, we have something that is very similar to your uh, to your local economic groups that was actually uh, cooperative uh, communities, you know. But guess what happens? The people still compete. First, they start to compete on who will save more labor force. If you are in a community that is actually pretty well off, the people will just save their labor force. They will not compete for the resources. So this is one problem. The whole system actually collapsed. Not ideologically. Of course, ideologically it collapsed already in 1968. But economically, it's collapsed at the end, or it was before the collapse, economic collapse uh, that can, came in the 1990s or, or a little bit later. That actually happens later in, in the Soviet bloc, in the whole Soviet bloc. So what is my question, actually, is uh, you say that, of course, with development, always inequalities appear. So I will tell you, but the inequalities are also linked to scarcity and us. And why the, the notion of development was so important was that we have to erase this scarcity from the, from the society. So then the people can be, all of them can be better off. Uh, so my question is, I believe, I personally believe, or what I can see, the people always compete for Scar for those scarce resources, no matter what. And the, my, my second question, or my second point is, I really like your metrics or coloniality, but I disagree you know, on several points. First of all, for you, very important is the appearance of capitalism. I will say that coloniality or, and colonialism exist from ever and will exist further. Uh, if you look on China and Vietnam, 
Okay, all of those actor uh, aspects that we can see in your matrix of coloniality was present a long time ago. You also say that political economy appeared in 17th century. I disagree. It was always here, always here. Uh, in Europe, we already can say even in 13th, 14th, 15th century with so-called states and division of the labor in uh, who can do this, who can do this, and who can do that. Some of them have the right to mine, some of them have the right to produce the beer, and so on, and so on. So I would say that it's always exist. Uh, production of knowledge is, again, uh, you can see that all over the, the Southeast Asia, or East Asia and partly Southeast Asia, uh, hand in hand with the Chinese colonization, as a spread of their knowledge that actually hierarchized the societies appear. So, uh, and last time I make a question, you just answer half. I was speaking about the internal and external colonization. So, when I see your matrix of of uh, of colonial uh, colonial colonial or colonial power, one I agree with that I like it very much. But maybe my mind is so catch in the structural uh, structural logic that I miss to see how it is embedded in the broader uh, picture of the relations of power. Seems to me that this matrix can be found on the every level of the colonization, from the from the interstate to state and to even people and people. In my mind, what exists among us is just a relation of power. And that's basically a problem of uh, elites. So as far as you have more power than me, you will be my elite. Last time, Professor uh, Alan Bros said here, sit by your side and say, we ordinary people. And you agree, actually. Hey, guys, you are not ordinary people. You are. If I look on the booklet that was printed here, roughly 50 pages is just your publications. Okay, you are actually very influential intellectual. That means you are an elite in our level. Okay? So, uh, in my mind, as far as someone can help a little bit more power than me, a little bit more knowledge is, a little bit, a little bit more wealth than me. That means he, he holds more scarce resources that I'm able to hold. Still, the competition will exist. Still, the relationship, still the power relationship in between us will function. So, what I can see in your notion is that, okay, fine, uh, this is an old colonial discourse that exists only in the 1930s. Here in the Asia, the main accomplishment or the main idea that came with the Western colonialism was individualism. And then the whole discourse appeared. What is better to be or what is more efficient? Uh, actually, many of those Asian scholars really welcome the Western ideas for one reason. It's freedom from the bound of theirs local or not local, actually native communities. That was actually family at that time. And until now it is family. So what seems to me that you are speaking about is only restructur restructurization of the relation of, of power that's in our societies. For you, maybe fine for 10 or 20 years further, let's to divide the power among the main uh, power player or main uh, forces. And then we will see what will happen. But again, you know, uh, I'm from Czech Republic, so we already do that three or four times, always from the bad to the worst. First, the communist revolution, then 1968 revolution, then Velvet revolution, and we still do not know where we are. So. In my opinion, the question will be, or something my question will be, 
how you would like to solve the relationship of the power between the entities and the ordinary people within your uh, very local economic communities or whatever else, you know, as far as you have a group, as you have a community, always you will have the leader here or some leadership or elites. And as far as elites will exist, relation of power and coloniality, no matter on what level it will be, will exist. That's all. check with you that the, whether or not my understanding is correct. And first of all, I think you already assume West is not an entity. Today, it's not an entity. Yes. So it is something that is produced by what you call enunciation, that is identification. But at the same time, I think the West as we understand it, it's over the time. Therefore, there is no way for any individual to say, certainly, I am Western. Because I can never be free uh, uh, Western. Hence, it constantly generates tremendous amount of anxiety. Um, So the, in this sense, the West always requires the non-West or the, the rest. Hence, without coloniality, it is impossible for the West to exist. Precisely, constantly referring to something other than West, and then show that the West is superior to it. And so in this sense, the, what you call the Western hegemony is not as some immediately some form of oppression. Rather, it is an accommodation of certain relationship in which it appears, it's not actually the case, Westerner and well, Asians are certainly their own identity. That appearance itself is a coloniality, I understand. And that, if that is the case, today, I think, when you talk about decolonization, there is a tremendous amount of anxiety, not only on the part of those who fashion themselves as Westerners, but also on those fashion themselves as Asians, Africans, uh, or uh, 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 Americans. So if that is the case, but as you pointed out, what kind of relation managed to sustain this Western hegemony? And then particularly today, I think uh, we, we witness virtually everywhere, I, I think, you mentioned that, for instance, today, um, a person from East Europe is not usually not regarded as Western. No. Yes. And increasingly, a person from the lower social class in the United States is not regarded as Western. Or, which is re directly related to the question of race, they are not actually regarded as white either. Therefore, those who are, you know, they believe they are white, are suffering from an amazing amount of anxiety. 
But the problem is that it seems to be uh, sort of the indication of tremendous uh, sort of the, uh, what should I say, danger of some fascistic reaction. And I think we are witnessing it virtually, not only uh, in, in Europe and North America, but actually in places like Japan and, and elsewhere. Uh, my name is Calvin. Um, I'm basically uh, from the science park. Um, <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm trying to 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 uh, point out something that is from a from a scientist or engineering perspective to 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 this issue of uh, Westernization. Um, a professor Milano's talk today mentioned the four global designs of westernization. So there are four of them. One is salvation by Christian conversion, then followed by salvation by uh, civilization and progress. Then we have salvation by modernization and development. And finally, the current stage is salvation by globalization and market democracy, which has been going on, according to the professor, uh, for some 20, 20 odd years, starting from 1990s. Now, I would like to add the fifth stage which is more pertinent to the current situation and which is salvation by science and technology. And by that I mean whoever in the current century, whoever, whichever country is able to come up with the latest and most advanced technology and science, scientific knowledge, that can come up with certain products with dominating effects globally. And through that technology, that particular country who are, cap who are capable of using that technology to mold public opinions, values, will very easily, in a matter of decades, to become the next global power, replacing easily the United States. So the fight is really over technology and science in a practical sense. And the US is, of course, by and large, the super player in this field. And they know that. And that's why they, they come up with all kinds of uh, policies and, 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 and uh, institutions to, to continue to make sure they, they will dominate in that in that uh, arena. Um, so to me, um, the concept of westernization is really now open to all countries. It's now open to any country. It's no longer a matter of the West against the East. It is, it's a battle over who controls the latest and the most advanced technology. And that country will be the winner. And that country will become the next power. I, I want to hear your comment on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. OK, I, I think I would, uh, because there are many things uh, Hello? Oh. Yeah? But I want to say, I forgot to address the question of narcissism. And, uh, Taiwan indigenous view because I think that uh, the question I, I remember that because it related to uh, to westernization I mean Marxism is part of westernization 
So somebody was mentioning that Mars is in the third world, the same that you mentioned. So Mars is, is part of Westernization, because Westernization is the bad, the good, and the, the ugly. Uh, it's not just the bad, right? Uh, so Christianity and uh, uh, is also part of uh, Westernization, which is not Buddhist, for example, and not Taoist. They are not kind of religion of expansion. Islam was. But then, uh, since the 16th century, Islam began to be controlled by Christianity, and that is the problem we are still facing now uh, between Islam and, and Christianity. It's not, I mean, uh, there is a lot of nuances there, but, uh, but the question is, uh, the question is this, I mean, just to understand what they mean. When France and England began to take over Spain, and Portugal, and the process of westernization. Where did they go? Think about that. They went to the Mughal Sultanate. Then they went to the Safavid Sultanate from when uh, Iran emerged. And then they went to the Ottoman Sultanate. Ha! Where a coincidence, <laughs> Western expansion gets to three uh, Muslim sultanate or caliphate, or, uh, whatever you want to call it, what about empire, or sultanate. So Francis is part of uh, this kind of Westernization. I don't know what, I don't know the situation of indigenous people in Taiwan, uh, but what I know about indigenous people in the Americas, and some in uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand, uh, they are fighting mainly for two things, land and knowledge. They have very, very, very clear. Uh, for example, the book that I mentioned very quickly by uh, Leanne Simpson, Nisha Anabek from Canada, it's a fantastic book if you want to address your question of languages that you were uh, referring to. Uh, a Dancing in Our Total Basket. She does a fantastic job in bringing all the Nishanabek concept to this mantra. For example, I mean, there are many examples, but there is uh, one is the development that they gave. The other is, all this kind of Western theory, post-colonialism, post-modernity, etc., is quite irrelevant for us because our theory is a storytelling. That is how we theorize. And the storytelling is a storytelling of the memory of indigenous people, but you have to do it all two ways. I mean, you do it in the community or you do it confronting Western knowledge, and they are doing both. They are working, with, but because they are educated, they are political theory, they are sociology, they are whatever. So they work with the community, and they call that re-emergence or resurgence. And at the same time, they write to confront Western knowledge. So what is fantastic is how she uses Nisha and Abek language to, I mean, it's, it's a very difficult, it's very easy to read, and it's very difficult because Page after page, you have to go to the index. And I said, What's, what is the, the, this uh, word means? So that is, I cannot do it because my, the language of education was Spanish. So Spanish has a very interesting political place in the colonial nature of power. Why? Because Spanish was imperial language in the 16th, 17th century. But by the 18th century, when the forces moved to England and France and Germany,